my ancient faith teaches me that no man is good enough to govern another man without that other's consent. Our Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights. this feeling every time I come to New Salem. It's like something happened here that can't be quite explained. Something happened to Abraham Lincoln. The people who lived in New Salem and knew Lincoln had a lot of tales. And they don't all agree. Maybe we'll never know for sure. But I have some theories. Whatever it was that changed Lincoln, it started right here, at the mill, originally built by John Cameron and James Rutledge back in 1829. One day, Lincoln came down the Sangamon River on a flatboat on his way to New Orleans. One woman who saw him said it was 1831, about the middle of April. And the water had dropped so much, their boat couldn't clear the mill dam. It got hung up and, and started taking on water at the stern. The first time I saw Lincoln, he was standing on that dam trying to pry the boat off. He had on a pair of blue jean breeches rolled up to his knees, a hickory shirt and a buckeye chip hat. And he was just standing there holding a long pole. In. Some say Lincoln got the boat off the dam without losing any of the cargo. Some say he didn't. I like to think he did, and then floated on down the river with a satisfied grin on his face. Why did he come back to live at New Salem? Probably because Denton Offutt, the man who owned the flatboat, also opened a store in New Salem and offered Lincoln a steady job. Some say Offutt was a clear-headed man of affairs. Others claim he was rattlebrained and reckless. Either way, he was a colorful character. One of the many who lived at New Salem. They were drawn here by the commercial opportunities of the frontier boom. When Lincoln arrived, he slept in the back of Offutt's store and he did whatever odd jobs there were for him. That's how New Salem became Lincoln's first permanent home away from his pioneer family. The log buildings you see here now were rebuilt on the foundations laid by the original settlers. He was 22 years old, big, strong, full of ambition. Some say he didn't have any idea what he would do with that ambition. What happened to change that? Uh, life sometimes has a way of teaching us what we should do. Like the story of Lincoln's fight with Jack Armstrong. They say that back then it was necessary to be equal parts of parts horse, of horse and, alligator. and alligator. <laughs> and to be able to vanquish one's weight in wild cats, like the Clary's Grove Boys. They were the protectors and the scourge of the whole countryside. As soon as Lincoln settled in at New Salem, the boys decided their leader, Jack Armstrong, would challenge Lincoln to a wrestling match. When Armstrong started getting the worst of it, his fellow boys joined in. Lincoln refused to go on. Said he'd wrestle them fairly, run a foot race, or if any of them wanted to fight, he'd be happy to thrash them one at a time. And Lincoln looked every word he said. None of the boys saw fit to accept the offer. Jack Armstrong called the match a draw. 
Lincoln had won him over. That fight may have been one of the most important victories of Lincoln's life. It won him respect. And winning the respect of other people was one of the guiding principles of Lincoln's life. Maybe that's what set his course on politics. An Indian fight broke out in Illinois, the Black Hawk War. Governor Reynolds called for troops, and Lincoln volunteered along with other New Salem men, including Jack Armstrong and the Clary's Grove Boys. To Abe's surprise, they elected him company captain. Lincoln later wrote that being elected captain by his fellow men gave him more satisfaction than any of his later successes. As soon as he was discharged from the military, he made his first bid for the Illinois State Legislature. Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I can say for one that I have no other so great as that of being truly esteemed of my fellow men by rendering myself worthy of their esteem. How far I shall succeed in gratifying this ambition is yet to be developed. Lincoln lost the election. For a while after that, he seems to have lost his way. He came back to New Salem to try to figure out what to do next. Somehow he had to make a living. It looks as though he just started trying things. First, there was the store. He went into, he went into business with William, William Barry. Barry. One of the local minister's boys. They bought an old stock of goods on credit, and then they bought a new building on credit and moved right next to Sam Hill's store. Now, Sam Hill was known to be a shrewd businessman, and he had good connections in St. Louis. Lincoln had plenty of wit, which his customers enjoyed, but uh, wit won't keep you in business. So while Sam Hill sat over there making a fat profit, Lincoln and Barry sat over here and did nothing but go deeper and deeper in debt. Lincoln once said the store just winked out. So he tried some other things. He was appointed postmaster. He really liked that job because it gave him the chance to read all the newspapers that came through the post office. He also got himself appointed deputy county surveyor. Lincoln didn't know a thing about surveying, but that didn't stop him. He got himself a compass and chain, studied Flint and Gibson a little, and to quote Lincoln, he went at it. That's pretty much the way he did everything. He just went at it. The fight with Jack Armstrong, his first campaign, the store. But maybe that wasn't so good. After all, he lost the election and the store failed. Then the sheriff auctioned off Lincoln's surveying instruments, along with his horse and saddle, to pay the delinquent business debts. But a man by the name of James Short, a friend of Lincoln's, bought the goods and returned them. It seems that Lincoln was achieving his ambition after all, to gain the respect of his fellow men. I've read a lot of stories that say Lincoln never forgot his friends at New Salem. He grew beyond them, but never away from them. And he never forgot the lesson. There is both good and bad in everything that happens. You have to work hard to bring about the most good. There are few things wholly evil or wholly good. Almost everything, especially of governmental policy, is an inseparable compound of the two. So that our best judgment tells When I think of speeches like that one, so full of depth and dignity, it's hard to believe they come from the same uncouth country boy who lived at New Salem. The boy whose pant legs are always six inches too short. The boy whose entire formal education amounted to less than a year. Deep inside, Abraham Lincoln must have been changing. I suspect that all the reading had something to do with it. 
Lincoln read everything he could get his hands on. Newspapers, pamphlets, letters, books. He once walked eight miles to borrow a textbook on English grammar. Then he began to read books about law. Lincoln had thought of studying law before, but he was afraid he couldn't do it because of his lack of education. And once he finally started, Lincoln took to the law with a passion. He would sit in the shade day in and day out, reading. A lot of people in New Salem just didn't understand. They thought Lincoln had just gotten lazy. But others realized the value of Lincoln's new knowledge. They hired him to draw up wills, simple contracts, and such. Possibly it was his desire to be a lawyer that prompted Lincoln to join the New Salem Debating Club to polish his public speaking. There's this wonderful letter by R.B. Rutledge that describes Lincoln's first speech. Okay, folks, our first speaker is Abe Lincoln, who's going to discuss the question. As he rose to speak, his tall frame towered above the little assembly. Both hands were thrust down deep in the pockets of his pantaloons. A perceptible smile at once lit up the faces of the audience, for all anticipated the relation of some humorous story. But he opened up the discussion in splendid style, to the infinite astonishment of his friends. He pursued the question with reason and argument so pithy and forcible that all were amazed. Maybe that's when Lincoln decided to give politics another try. If elected, I shall consider the whole people... When election time came in 1834, Lincoln made his second run for the legislature. While acting as your representative, I promise... This time, the people were ready for Lincoln. He won a seat in the Illinois House of Representatives and began the career that would lead to the presidency. He had come to New Salem as directionless as a piece of driftwood. Six years later, he left as a lawyer and a statesman. What changed him? His victories, his failure, his friendships? Lincoln left New Salem in 1837. By 1840, the whole village was pretty well deserted almost as if the village rose up out of the wilderness to meet Lincoln and then faded away again once he was gone. Somehow this place changed the man and changed the course of history. Whatever happened to Lincoln at New Salem, you can almost hear its echo. Countrymen, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right. stroll through the village. Listen. Watch. Let your imagination carry you back. Back to the time when Abraham Lincoln walked in this very place. <laughs> 